Okay. Okay, see you. Yeah. yeah. Okay, this will be our last, should we say, uh, normal lecture. Next week we will... A um, few words on the plants now. Um, today we will kind of finish the textbooks. Next week we will do the exercises, this exercise 5, as well as last year's... No, oh, two years ago's exam. Uh, the exam is the 29th of October, isn't it? Tuesday? Yeah. So there will be kind of a full week in between next week. Uh, yes, starting with the 20th. So you have a week here to prepare. Okay, so that should be sufficient. In my opinion, of course, remember that you are allowed to bring all your written aids. Uh, one question, do you need a calculator? Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> we will see. Uh, it may be that, uh, does everybody have a calculator? Okay, then bring it. Okay, I think it's a good idea. It may be that you need to make some multiplications or some additions, who knows? That seems not out of the question if you think about the course. So uh, I will suggest that you bring one. I will try to make it in a way that it's uh, of as little use as possible, but um, it may be easier. Okay. So that's the plan. Um, is this clear for you? Okay. Now yesterday we started talking about this assignment kind of problems. Um, and we kind of started out simple. We kind of assumed that we have a set of costs. Okay? C1, C2, up to C capital I. This was the kind of subscript which, which refers to the actual model. So this is the cost of hiring one location, this is the cost of hiring another location, and so on, okay? And of course, if the aim is to find the cheapest cost, then it's easy. Then we just sort this vector and, and pick the smallest one. And that is kind of what this first model actually does. So if we, if we introduce this binary variable, di, which is one if location i is picked and zero elsewhere. Then if we look at d1 times c1 plus d2 times c2 plus all the other deltas times ci and want to minimize this function and add the constraint 93 on top there which says that d1 plus d2 plus all the other deltas should equal 1, then this model does exactly that pick out the one location which is cheapest. Okay? This is banal as it says, or a ridiculously simple model. The idea here is kind of to introduce the logic to, to the next one. And then we kind of added different attribute const constraints. The, the idea here is that we can kind of think of a location containing attributes, different qualities and characteristics. It, it could be the number of chairs, it could be the, the catering opportunities and so on. A lot of different uh, categories of, of, uh, of characteristics or, or attributes as we tend to call them here. And uh, of course then you can kind of add constraints on these attributes, saying I need a certain quality, I need a certain size, and so on. Or you could alternatively kind of put this expression into the objective as well. If you do that, then you have to make a kind of direct trade-off between these two, don't you? If you kind of minimize apples and pear, then you have to kind of compare them. So you have to make some kind of uh, values which you add in front of one of the term and the other type of term and kind of make a weighing. So if you want to make, make these twice as important as the other one, you'd have two here and one there, if you see my point. Okay? But this is not obviously easy. So in practice, what you typically would do would be to use the constraint. So I need this kind of so seating, I need this kind of quality and so on. And given that, let me pick the cheapest one. And the idea then is, of course, that when you kind of add more and more of these, then it gradually becomes more and more complex. 
But if we think about the situation here, this is typically not the situation we're looking for in events. The typical situation is, is slightly different and is slightly more complex. If you think about a music festival, then you don't have a single artist, then you have a set of artists. Okay? So let's look at the, the other situation where you have a set of artists. As it says, let's now assume we have a set of artists, uh, we can call it something, let's uh, call a certain artist, artist I, and this set is, uh, let's say, A1, A2, up to some A, uh, A, okay, I use the capital A to kind of number up the number of artists. So now we have a kind of one bag of artists and one bag of location. And the idea is to match these two bags together, okay? Decide which artists should perform where and which, in that case, which location should receive a certain artist. It says here, obviously, the number of artists must be smaller than or equal to the number of locations. Do you find that logical? Of course, if you have too few locations, if you have five locations, you cannot make five, you cannot distribute ten artists in parallel. Of course you can do it if you kind of place it in time. And you, in, in practice you would do that, but we, in this situation we kind of assume simplicity, so we assume here that, that we have a kind of equal number here of locations and artists. So we have made a decision here on what locations to pick and that location number equals the number of artists we want to distribute on the locations. So then we define a slightly different uh, binary structure. We say that uh, delta ij equals 1 if artist i is located at location j. Okay? So we need two subscripts, one to kind of link to the artists and one to link to the locations, i and j. And it's 1 if you do that location, 0 elsewhere. Now, this is the so-called classical assignment model. This is a very well-known model in logistics. It's normally not used in this setting. It's typically used in... Yeah, it could be used in uh, assigning engineers to a set of tasks, for instance. Uh, and it's also been used, as I previously told you about, in, in kind of matchmaking between, in kind of low sense, which is kind of old far out when it comes to practical applications. But uh, these kind of problems are kind of typical in many situations. They are specifically typical in project-oriented work. You know the difference, about difference between project orientation and running orientation? In a running situation you kind of have a stuff, okay? These people are hard, they know what to do. So the location problem, kind of deciding who should do what, is kind of not necessarily there. But in, pro in a project setting, where you kind of need to set up a new organization, then you have to make these decisions. You have to decide who should do what. So you kind of have to assign persons to different tasks, subtasks in the project. Uh, a more local example here would, of course, be assigning students to courses or assigning exams to rooms and these kind of stuff. Okay, so these assignment problems are kind of often solved in educational settings. The model here should be straightforward to understand. Uh, of course, when we have two subscripts here, we have to add together all these delta ij's times cij, which is the cost element for, for each location. And if you add all together, of course, that would construct your total cost. So depending on the values of these deltas, then you get different cost elements. And the idea is, of course, to pick the, the cheapest one. But that's, of course, not enough, isn't it? If you don't add some constraints here, it's very easy to, to find out what the solution here should be, isn't it? If you kind of put a cross over these constraints here, what would be the solution of this single unconstrained optimization problem? Can you tell me that? We assume that these CIJs are positive, so these are kind of, they have these positive costs involved here. And we want to find the solution with the minimal cost without these constraints. What kind of solution would that be? Uh, Zero. Yeah, exactly, Jonas. What uh, could you uh, elaborate? No. 
Oh, you couldn't? No. No. no, no, no. Of course, uh, if, ever it, if doing something costs something, then the cheapest thing is to do nothing, isn't it? Yeah. So this delta i j star equals to zero would be the optimal solution of an assignment problem without assignment constraints, obviously. Okay, then we do nothing. And that's not very interesting, is it? So to kind of to make this interesting, you have to force the model to pick some locations and, and kind of assign these artists to these locations. And then in order to do that, you kind of use the same type of logic as we did previously, but in, in a sense you have to do it in both dimensions. So this first one, uh, <coughs> nine eight, as it says here, picks one and only one artist to each location. Okay, you, you have a certain location here, L3, and you have the artists. And of course you must pick one artist and not two to each of these locations. So it should equal one here. That secures that for all locations J, there is an artist. The other one does the opposite. It secures that for each, each artist I gets a location. Okay, so you kind of have to secure on both ends here, so to speak, to make the logic viable. This is the type of problem we have seen before. It's a linear program. It uh, does, however, have some special structures as opposed to what you've seen before. It has only binary variables. So this is a special case of a li linear program. It, it has a special name in logistics theory. We tend to call it a PIP. It stands for pure integer program. You remember we had something called MILP, Mixed Integer Linear Program, then had kind of a mix of continuous as well as binary variables or integer variables. In this case you only have binary variables. You might expect that these problems are easier to solve than these, but that's not given. Okay? It's, it could be very difficult to solve these problems as well. In general we could say that if you stick to only LPs, they are easy to solve, but these categories are typically much harder. These problems are easy to solve if dimensions are small. Okay, if you have two artists, two locations, then you can ju lo just look at all possibilities, can't you? And then you can look at, uh, you can do artist one at either location one or two, and the same with two, you get four, and you can just compare the costs of this and pick the cheapest one by hand. The problem is if this becomes big, then it be the number of possible uh, Instances becomes very big and it's, it's kind of hard to, to solve it. But in general these, these uh, so-called assignment problems which, which these are referred to are, are, are uh, relatively easy to solve. Uh, but, and that's what I say, we can kind of think about this problem now, again adding these other constraints that we need certain demands on our location. It could be certain wishes from the artist's side, okay? Uh, Mick Jagger, he wants to perform there or there, but not there and there. Okay? Of course, these kind of wishes could be entered into this kind of model, and they don't necessarily make it easier to solve. Okay? Because they kind of, they, of course, they cut down the opportunity set, but not necessarily in a way that makes it easier to solve, especially if, the, if uh, everything is big. If you think about allocating uh, students to exam rooms, of course there, there is, depending then on the size of the group, if you have a big group, then there, there is a smaller number of rooms to pick from than a small group, okay? Now these kind of things must be added. And of course in this case, there is quality difference on the artists. Some artists are expected to draw a big attendance. Those artists must be put at locations where a big attendance can sit, if its differences on the capacity of the, of the different localities. So you can kind of ex expand this model in many different directions, kind of building on what we have discussed so far. I seem to recall uh, that uh, the last exam was actually fiddling a little bit with this model. So we will, we will look further into it when we look at uh, the exam from uh, two years ago next week. But the point is that we can use our kind of basic model thinking as well as our basic model solving through Lingo to solve these kind of problems, if, if that's of interest. 
but we need these kind of tools to do it unless we want to do it by hand which is uh, which is tedious so uh, one question to discuss could of course be let's let's look at this institution here do do we use these me methods when we assign let's say uh, uh, a topics to exams the answer to that is no we don't why don't we of course again we have some experience we know that uh, the big courses like uh, microeconomics and so on, they need to have these rooms so that then they will be placed immediately okay so we can kind of start solving it by filling in the big guys first and then we have some small courses left and okay they could be there or there or there and the point is that it doesn't really matter that much whether you stay in room 258 or the neighboring room that doesn't really matter to you does it nor to us so this cost element in our setting is very minor it doesn't matter and the problem then is of course that if you feed these kind of data into a model it wouldn't really be able to distinguish okay you can get all kinds of solutions it, it doesn't really matter because the cost difference in kind of doing that opposed to this doesn't really matter and then of course you don't get the information necessary but if you think about the events it could be substantial differences here if you want to hire different localities it could be different hiring costs it could be definitely difference differences in uh, in uh, in the attributes and the qualities of the different event venues if you look back on the, the jazz festival here, there's been a lot of changes during the, uh, the whole history on where, where the venues have been. They started out relatively modest, without much, but of course as kind of quality demands from the audience has increased, especially on the sound side, you need to have much more structure on where to stage your concerts. And of course when it comes to music, the sound quality is important. I assume most of you have been to concerts with bad sound and that's not necessarily a nice experience unless you're quite drunk. Fortunately, most people are quite drunk on these events, so it doesn't matter so much. But uh, still, it's uh, not really a good reason not to do this as good as possible. Okay. Finally, we are kind of, we finished fast today, okay, luckily. I have a meeting, so we have to, anyway. Do you have any questions on these matters, on this assignment kind of thing? No, we don't have any questions. You're not asking much questions. Not yet. No, it starts to get late now. I, I, I hope uh, next week we'll be filled with questions then. Uh, you went sequencing. The final chapter in the book. It doesn't contain much information. Um, again, it could have been much larger. We discussed sequencing or scheduling problems in the first part of the course, in chapter 8, remember? We kind of discussed this example where we had these machines and these jobs that were to kind of be fed into them and it was a question kind of sorting this out. If you think about events, this is a classical problem. Okay? You have a set of artists, you have a set of locations and it's not enough just to make this assignment we have made here. You also have to make other decisions. You have to sort this in time. Which artists should play on Monday, which should play before lunch and after lunch and so on. All these decisions will have to be made. And these are not easy decisions necessarily. And the key here is uh, what is kind of stated here in the in the two first, uh, we can read what, what it says. It says that event sequencing may be defined as how to sequence or schedule sub-events within a bigger event optimally. In principle, we have learned what is necessary here. Look back in chapter 8, so we kind of discuss the kind of building blocks to make the models. But in that case, we kind of focused on speed, tardiness, being late and that kind of stuff, but uh, of course, making and as a sequence of artists which kind of stops before 10 in the ending is really not the point here, is it? That, that's not the point. So we're not interested in speed here. That's obviously not what we're aiming for when we're thinking about events. Of course, tardiness could be relevant. We don't want these concerts to start too, too late. But again, 
perhaps not the main point. So the main point kind of pops up on the third point here. It says, however, the demand links may be important. If the sequence affects our demand, then how we sequence sub events obviously is important. So if the kind of the number of spectators depends on how we sort our event, then it is important. Then we will have to. The, the, the problem, of course, is, is then is that we have to kind of establish this demand link. We kind of need information. What happens to demand if Rolling Stones play on Monday versus Saturday? Okay. So if they play on Saturday, we know then we get 10,000 spectators, but if they play on Monday, we only get 2,000. Then we know that, but we need that information. And not only for the one of the artists, but for all artists and all possible combination of event dates. Okay. So that information must be present. Okay. But if we have that present, that information, then we can do this. Then we can build mathematical models of the same type as we did in chapter 8. Uh, and we can kind of make an optimal sequence, if you like. But again, of course, this is not normally done in practice, uh, but still, these decisions must be made. In general, what you normally see is that the best artists play closer to the weekend than the worst artists. But there may be a few exceptions. It may be that you put some good artists early, or that you distribute good ar artists on each day. So on each day, there is at least one good artist. You see my point? That's kind of what we see if we kind of look at most music festivals. The sequencing problem is, of course, not restricted only to music events. It's very important in sport events. If you think about planning an Olympic game, of course, there is a lot of se sequencing possibilities. Is it what kind? What should be the opening match? What should be the opening event, and so on? What should be the final event? What should be in between? How should the structure in between events be? Sh are you to avoid competition in between? Cannibalization, as we tend to call it. So there's a lot of problems here in actually doing this. Um, I'm tempted to say that doing this formally in events is very difficult because there is so much to kind of take care of. So, so that is perhaps the main reason why, why, I cannot, why, why I didn't actually go into formulating examples here, kind of going into the model world directly. So uh, th the main idea of this chapter is, is basically then to kind of just discuss what this means. Then we have the concept of doing what we ref refer to as static sequencing or dynamic sequencing. Static sequencing is what you do when you define a football league in most countries. So before the league starts, you define all the matches, okay? But in principle, you don't have to do that. You can do dynamic sequencing instead, meaning that you first define who should play in the first round, and then you observe the results, results of the first round before you define who should play the second round. And you can keep on doing that. So that is the difference between static and dynamic sequencing. And of course this is important. If it is such that demand is affected by a sequence, then it's probably even more important that it will be perhaps dependent on the results of your first event day or your first event or whatever. And that could also affect demand for the rest of your event. So let me take a simple example. If we now uh, focus on the World Championship in football in Brazil next year, of course, if Brazil is kicked out of the first round, okay, that could happen, of course. Although it's not very possible, it could happen. Then it may well be that the sequence which is laid is not the best one, okay, when it comes to attracting the enormous amount of audience you would expect. And it could be more serious than that, because it could be that you have already sold out the tickets to the wrong persons. Okay. Of course, you don't necessarily lose money on it because you've already sold the tickets, but it could be a, a great market turning out. and It could be that keeping tickets uh, for the second stage is a good idea. So these things are kind of connected and you need to think about it. I don't suggest that you necessarily in practice should use this kind of artillery to attack it, but you must be aware of these, fa these, these important facts. They must be handled. In practice, it's kind of done relatively simple, but uh, maybe with a lot of discussion. So this is more like a negotiation type of solution than a mathematical modeling type of solution in practice. So there are, of course, different wishes here among different people in, in kind of arranging these events. And this, this process normally kind of is more like negotiation than pure logic. 
So, I think we have talked about the most important parts. Of course, you can extend this into even more complex stuff. You, you probably don't, in reality, of course, you really don't know what will happen here. And if it is, if it is such that certain events depend on previous events, and, if, and then, of course, there will be uncertainty on whether this will happen or not, and then, then you can see we can kind of make very complex structures here on how to, to handle this. So, so, so this is very difficult in general. Uh, we could say that uh, for relatively simple events, this is not tough. Uh, in most cases, it's more a mat matter about doing it. But when we talk about lo logistics, we really don't talk about doing it. We assume that that is possible. We're kind of looking at ways of doing it better, more efficient, giving more money or less money or whatever. Okay, so that, that is kind of the idea we put behind a logistics approach when it comes to handling stuff. So, that kind of ends this course, okay? I hope you have learned some logistics. Well, actually, I think you have. Uh, whether you have found any interest in this, I really don't know. And maybe I don't care either. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. So, if you, if you kind of feel that this is something for you, you should of course come and talk to me and we can kind of discuss some kind of master topics which could, could under... You can look into these matters. Uh, there is many options here, as you probably understand. We can attack from many angles. We can look at forecasting, production planning, inventory planning, scheduling, sequencing, assignments. There's a lot of stuff to look at here, which we have been briefly discussing in this course. You should remember that we have kind of only touched a very small part of the iceberg in this course. We have, uh, due to time restrictions, not been able to go into the level of detail which is perhaps necessary to really understand what this is about. And of course, if you really want to do this, you should have a certain interest in computing, okay? either on a piece of paper and mathematical equations, or, or both computers as means of solving problems, because this is the kind of tools we use a lot here. Okay? We formulate models, we solve them, first one time and maybe a second time and maybe hundreds or thousands or million times. So we change the way we solve them, looking for better ways to do it. We change the data or our models to see how they respond, what will happen if we do this. Could we arrange or suppose we made a thought experiment that we instead of restricting